Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge to the traditional owners of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. I pay my respects to their elders of the past, present, and emerging. Well, today's subject. In one way or another, we all carry trauma. It can manifest itself in anxiety, depression, shame, addiction. The list goes on and on. And in fact, studies consistently show that approximately 70 to 80% of women will experience a traumatic event at least once in their lives. And we're certainly becoming very aware of that in the current conversation about sexual harassment, about child sexual abuse and about domestic violence. So this, these issues of traumatic events are very real and very much part of our conversation, which is such a great thing and a reason why I'm so excited to be doing this podcast today. The prevalence rates for women, as I said, 70 or 80%, but for men experiencing trauma in their lifetime, it's even higher, up to 90%, which is a little surprising. Um, so my guest today is Dr. Sarah Woodhouse. She's a research psychologist who specialises in trauma and is passionate about helping people face this word, trauma, and also their past. And interestingly, and she shares some of that with us herself, as someone who's experienced her own trauma, she presents insightful and important information alongside an honest account of her own unique story. The book is called You're Not Broken, Break Free from Trauma and Reclaim Your Life. Look, I just so enjoyed this conversation. There was so much in it. I felt like, well, I felt like I spent an hour with a, a wonderful therapist and, and it was just a wonderful experience. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Sarah Woodhouse. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Hi. Hey there. I'm so happy to be here. Sarah, you've written this book and, you know, I think it will resonate with everybody uh, and we're going to dive into some aspects of it. But I wondered if you might just share with us your journey, which brought you to the point of writing this very book. Oh, yeah, very happily. I don't know where to start, though. Oh, my goodness. Well, let's not go from birth, although <laughs> for well, some I was people three, that's a traumatic experience. I was three years old. <laughs> <laughs> for some people, that's a traumatic experience oh, too. Gosh, but, absolutely. Well, I'll leave it with you. I mean, your psychology background, let's stick with relevant things and uh, yeah. off you go. Tell us absolutely. a bit about, well, about the your quick, journey. I'll, I'll, so the sort of quick version of it is I was, I was, so before I went into psychology, I worked as a lobbyist. Mm. So I was a lobbyist in the music industry. Wow. And so the, the uh, because of the lobbying job, I ended up working with a charity called Reprieve. Who I don't know if you've heard of. Have you heard of them? They're absolutely no. brilliant. They are they, they bring people back from kind of secret prisons. So who are being held in extraordinary rendition. Wow. So they repatriate people. So they were very fundamental in the campaigns against Guantanamo, for example. Mm -hmm. So they realized that music was being used as a form of torture. So they approached our trade body, the music trade body, and said, look, this is happening. What do you think? So we were engaged in a lot of conversations with them about that. And as a result of that, I began working alongside incredible clinical psychologists who, of course, were trauma specialists mm. uh, because they were, you know, the, the guys they were they were bringing back had extreme, very elevated um, PTSD. Mm -hmm. So speaking with those guys and speaking with the clinical psychologist it just took me I just became so fascinated in what trauma was what it is how how it can affect people in this way I became very taken with the question of sort of why do we all react differently because at the same time personally I had spoken I'd been working with a therapist and she had said to me look I, all of your symptoms everything you bring to me it looks it looks a lot like trauma I think something might have happened and you reacted to it and you're still reacting to it. I still remember that appointment. I was probably about 23, 24. And so I had that going on in my personal life and this going on in my professional life. And it literally was within the same kind of couple of months. And I just became taken. Mm. You know, it, it Suddenly my world was trauma, but not in a, in an overwhelming way. Even it was just, I just became fascinated with this idea, you know, what, what is trauma? 
why do we all react so differently to it? How can this be trauma over here that these guys have experienced? And what I've experienced, how are they the same thing? So I just became really taken with it. And within about three months, I'd handed in my notice as a lobbyist. I'd approached the University of Sussex and began um, studying trauma, researching trauma at a very in-depth level. Um, speaking of birth trauma, I did a, I've done a huge amount of work into that. Uh, the Uni University of Sussex was so, so supportive. Um, and, you know, did it all the way up to, to doctoral level, yeah. came here. Um, I, I was offered research grants, but it just didn't feel right. I'd moved to Australia and I, I suppose because of my lobbying background and my editorial background, I've always loved communicating. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a, I'm a talker, I'm a writer, really passionate about it all. So I wanted to, I suppose I wanted to step back into that world. So instead of applying for a new research grant, I decided to write the book and, yes. and it draws together all my research, all my personal experience. Um, and, and I suppose that that's why I did it. And, and at the same time, I remember me too was going on. So there was, there was, there was just a lot going on globally and I just felt it was the right time for the book. And I'm so pleased that I did given COVID and the, the levels of trauma, I think we're going to see in, in, most people over the next five years, I am so pleased I wrote the book. Mm -hmm. and, and isn't it a cathartic experience to do just that, write a book, uh, which actually is almost like drawing a line in the sand from what has been in the past, reflecting on it all, and a great springboard for moving forward. Oh, my goodness. On a personal level, you mean? Yes. Yes, Simply. absolutely. absolutely. Like it, has, it has healed me, mm. you know, in, in a way that I wasn't expecting because you draw everything together, you make conclusions, you, you find the narrative, mm. you know, so, so you're joining the dots between these life experiences, these lessons. So these lessons that I'd learned in my personal life and in my healing journey, I was then putting them in the context of what I had learned as a researcher and all those incredible conversations that I had. So you're drawing it together. You're kind of, so it's, it's really the most incredible process. And you, you would know that from writing your book. It, mm -hmm. it, it is healing. It's, as you say, it's just totally cathartic. It's, I would recommend it to anyone. I yes, think everyone I, I, should write a book. It's I a agree with you. I absolutely do. agree with you. And be prepared to do many, many drafts. And in fact, I'm yeah. not sure whether in your case, um, but I, I, I've heard the expression, you never actually finish a book like this. You just abandon it. At some point, you have to let it go. But that's part of what this podcast is all about, actually, because after I finished writing the book, I thought there's so much more I want to explore and I get to talk to people like you and they answer questions and I learn so much more and I hope my listeners do too. And you've mentioned so much already there about the different types of trauma, about your own experience with it and your own epiphany that you actually had a trauma. I wonder if we could just take a step back and kind of define what we mean by trauma? How do we define it? How common is the problem? In terms of a definition, I think the easiest, the easiest way to define it is, is that it's a reaction. So trauma is a reaction to any experience that makes us feel overwhelmed, threatened and out of control. So they're the three things. So overwhelmed, threatened and out of control. That's the base of it. And and when you when you think about that, of course, big, severe experiences often provoke that reaction in us, right? If you're thinking about assault, if you're thinking about natural disasters, all the bushfires, many people will have experienced that. They will have felt so overwhelmed, so threatened and out of control. And then that's the baseline for our flight, fight, freeze response, that reaction. But what we've learned is that very commonplace everyday events can also provoke that experience in us and that is especially true of children because remember what it's like to be a kid it's so how often do we feel overwhelmed as a child quickly easily and strongly right mm. that sense of overwhelm the sense of threat you know someone's knocking at the door or oh gosh are they going to be okay climbing up that tree it's you, you feel threatened easily and, and quickly. And then at the same time, feeling out of control is also very common in childhood. So it's it particularly true in childhood that everyday commonplace experiences, and when I say that, I mean things like, you know, just everyday slips, slips and falls, um, issues in relationships, obviously for children, issues within the parental relationship, like feeling unseen and unheard, feeling unloved, 
um, that that can really provoke those reactions in a child. It can be very overwhelming, of course, if you don't feel understood or if you don't feel loved. It can feel like a threat to your survival because they're reliant on parents for literally for their survival. Right, they need the parent to to look after their 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 needs, their daily needs, and their emotional needs. And then, of course, they can become quickly feeling out of control. They can feel powerless. So. And along with that, the everyday experiences with things like routine medical appointments that has been shown to lead to trauma. Um, it's it's what, what I would say to people is rather than me giving you a big long list of mm. things that can provoke mm. a, a traumatic reaction, it's better to think about the three things that I said. So think about overwhelm, think about threat and think about feeling out of control. Yes. And any event that you think could make any human respond that way on an emotional level and you're in the trauma zone. So when I when I scan up to COVID at the moment, do I think it's going to make people feel overwhelmed? Yes. Do I think they're all sitting at home in the UK, in the US, feeling threatened? Yes, I do. Do I think they feel out of control? Yes, I do. So I'm very concerned from a trauma perspective. We're, we're in that zone. Same of bushfires, you know, whether you're looking big, whether uh, are those big events or whether you're looking at the everyday ones, they're the three things to focus on. That is, that's so, I mean, uh, Sarah, my background professionally is dentistry. Ah, interesting. And when you talk about trauma, uh, overwhelmed, threatened, out of control, yeah. you could almost define every potentially and thankfully, this isn't the case. Certainly, I haven't found it to be the case. I've been very conscious of those things for my patients. And I know our practice has been, and I know many dentists are, but a dental experience is an example of something like you've just explained. It's interesting, though, isn't it, Because the point you make, because there are some events which are just everybody would acknowledge, wow, that must have been so traumatic, a physical assault, a sexual assault, um, a sudden accident, a fall, whatever. Um, but defining it as overwhelming, threatening and out of control opens up a whole world of trauma, potential trauma for everybody. I mean, who hasn't been traumatised? Mm. Well, and that's exactly my point. In, in one way or another, we all carry trauma and there's no point pretending otherwise. It is a part of being human. We mm. have all experienced the traumatic reaction. That does not mean we all have PTSD. Absolutely not. Mm. Uh, but it does mean we've all experienced that traumatic reaction. Now, in some of us, it will have resolved. OK, so some of us will have experienced that traumatic reaction and within a month or two, the reaction will have resolved. And there are lots of reasons that would have helped that happen. We'd have talked about our feelings. We'd have been around people who validated our feelings. So they would have, um, you know, said, you're looking very frightened. You're looking like you need a cuddle. There would have been a lot of support kind of pulling around them. Um, uh, what, what else would it be that, that there would have been people around them that would have uh, been extremely grounding? So, so adults. So, if we're looking particularly at children now, so the adults around them would have been able to stay very grounded and strong, which is very difficult for most parents, right? If I see my kids going through something, it's hard to come back to that centered space where you can be their rock. But if we can do it, we help them co-regulate. So when they experience that reaction. You see them becoming extremely overwhelmed, very frightened um, and, and feeling out of control. If as a parent, you can, of course, we react. So allow yourself to react, but then come back to a place of calm. If you can regulate your breathing, use, use different breathing techniques because you are regulated, you will help them regulate. So. I love that expression, co-regulate. Yes, isn't I it love, beautiful? It's a beautiful expression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the whole issue, it, you mentioned also fight and flight, and we're talking mm -hmm. about the impact of this on a person's nervous system, but what are some of the impacts? What are some of the symptoms of trauma? You've also mentioned PTSD, and I suppose we should not assume everybody knows what that means. Maybe we could just flesh that out a bit too. What, what are some of the symptoms of trauma? Yeah, they are extremely, extremely broad. Mm. So I actually think it can be quite confusing for people because I'm saying, well, trauma is a reaction that happens here. So when you're however old it might be, and it can be as varied as um, people pleasing is a common reaction. 
So all the behavioral things we would see, so compulsive eating, addictions, um, compulsive busyness, compulsive shopping, um, avoiding your feelings. Okay, so you've got all those behavioral things. Um, you've got the emotional emotional reactions. So um, feeling, and this is the key point, it, it's not just feeling shame, it's feeling stuck in shame. Um, or, or, or So your shame is regularly triggered. Okay, so shame, anger, fear, and of course, attached to that is also anxiety. So you've got all the emotional stuff and, and the physical sensations that go along with those emotions because they're, they're very physical experiences, aren't they? If we feel frightened, it, we feel it all through our body, top to toe. Mm. Um, and then there are the cognitive things too, the cognitive symptoms like low self-belief, um, negative thinking patterns, um, uh, black and white thinking, confusion. So they're the three main areas is you've got the cognitive symptoms, you've got um, the, the physical and emotional, and then you've got the behavioral. And it spans all the way across those. And actually, it, to, to complicate matters more, if you've been living with a dysregulated nervous system mm. over time, there are also a lot of outcomes that we see. So physical health outcomes like chronic fatigue, chronic pain, even cancer. Um, has has is now been linked back to adverse childhood experiences in particular. Mm. So symptoms are very very broad, um, and and up here you've got PTSD, which is extreme and elevated symptoms. So you would have from each of those kind of categories, you'd have multiple ones of them, and they'd be lasting for a long time, and they'd be a bit at a, be at a high level. So you've got a high, high amount of symptoms, but then looking further down, you can have people who would only experience one or two of them, but are still able to recognize as they kind of um, lift the lid on it a little bit, as they begin looking and thinking, they realize that actually they're experiencing this difficult symptom today. So often having their shame triggered, for example, or prolonged and ongoing anxiety is a very common one. They're realizing actually that did happen in response to an event when I was younger, when I felt overwhelmed, threatened and out of control. Mm. Gosh, what a minefield we've opened up here, Sarah, yes. because, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I think everybody would reflect back on an event as a young child which still sticks in their mind and maybe it was you thought your parent, you know, the parents were going out at night and you wondered what happens if they never come home, you know. I mean, I think everyone's had that kind of feeling and how that's dealt with and the way another child speaks to another child and the effect that has within the group. I mean, it's a total minefield, isn't it? But it's great to have this conversation because yeah. it's, um, and this is so important. Uh, how do, uh, well, let's, before we lob into how do we deal with the problem? Let's just mm. still stay with this because you mentioned COVID and this particularly globally challenging period we've been in. How are you seeing it? What are you seeing some of the challenges we're facing because of, of what's been going on? I mean, the thing that immediately comes to mind is that trauma for, for many of us, not everyone, but the vast majority of people that experience trauma become avoidant. So what that means is they push their feelings away. They push their feelings away and they push other people away. So they really go inwards. And it, it really is a big problem and it sits at the crux of why this, why, you know, I said before, for some people, their symptoms resolve so they can experience the traumatic reaction and then the symptoms will resolve, they'll lessen and over time it, it just it just fades away and they get on with life. Whereas for others, they kind of become stuck in the reaction and it actually can grow and, and morph into all these, these bigger issues that I, that I mentioned. A big difference between, if you take those two people, a big difference between them would be the, the way they cope. Okay, so the person who gets stuck in it, often they're the people that become very avoidant. So they push their feelings away. So instead of allowing the feelings to flow, instead of allowing them to come out, which really is what we want. So trauma is all about being stuck. Okay, so trauma tamps everything down, all the feelings down, and we almost become like a pressure cooker. What we need is movement, you know, and all of the treatments, that's what it's about. It's about getting things moving, whether it's cognitively or emotionally, or even physically, if you think of, you know, the incredible somatic um, treatments and, and treatments like dance, dance therapy, things like that. It's all about getting things moving. 
So the reason I highlight that is because when I when I picture the world at the moment and I picture everyone sitting in their houses, and I'm especially thinking here about people who live on their own, um, I, I know that the thing we need to be careful of is that avoidance. And I feel like people are being almost having no choice but to go down that path. Mm. They're, they're, they're going inward. Zoom is incredible. I mean, look what we're doing now. It's an amazing thing, right? Mm. But it, it can't be everything. And, and I think a lot of people are feeling so overwhelmed, so threatened and out of control that they're actually push, pushing it away and pushing people away because there's that natural closing in any way. It's making it worse. Mm. So I suppose that's the thing that comes to mind is the thing that I'm, I'm most concerned about because yeah. I just don't think see how things can resolve, how they can get things moving without people to talk to. Mm. You know, it's that yeah. simple. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? I mean, uh, we, we before we came onto this podcast, we're both reflecting on our connection with the UK. Mm. You, you, you obviously are from the UK and my wife is too. But, but taking London, the Blitz, as an example and comparing it to the COVID experience, I mean, having bombs dropped on you is incredibly traumatic and certainly if your house is blown up and people around you dying. But I think one of the observations that surprised people about the Blitz was um, how incredibly resilient people were psychologically because it brought them together together. They saw the best in human beings helping each other and they were connected and, and, and empowered in many ways. And, and looking at that as an extreme example of a potential trauma, but recognising the personal connections that were powerful and comparing that to now where, you know, actually you can't go out and hug your neighbour and see if they're all right and help them with whatever you... You're actually isolated and, and to see what the bigger trauma is long-term will be an interesting experiment that we're still to unfold. I agree. I, I, you, such an incredibly powerful observation. I agree with that. It's because you look at it and from the surface, you think, well, obviously the blitz is worse. So obviously you're going to experience more mm. trauma, but then you look at COVID. <clears throat> I mean, really the fact that, that, that people aren't able to co-regulate they aren't able to voice their feelings they aren't able to because the, the other thing that if you think about what our social support does for us and the thing that I found in my research is when we're having those days when we think we're awful and the world's awful and oh what you know and imagine the COVID context what if I get COVID and, and what if dad dies and you know all these awful things that that fly through our minds we need to have people around us to say it's okay you know, I feel like I'm going to cry when I say that, but don't, isn't that a big part of social support? They say, it's going to be okay. Mm. I've got you. We're going to be okay. So for those people that don't have that, that are, you know, there is so much health anxiety. You see that on social media all the, all the time. People are genuinely afraid, genuinely, genuinely afraid that they and their loved ones are going to die, mm. you know? Mm. So, so that's the context. So they're feeling deeply threatened, deeply overwhelmed, and deeply out of control. So, so I and and unlike the blitz, unlike that kind of situation where you can club together, you can see your neighbours, you can help each other, they are alone. Mm. So it is is extremely worrying. I agree. And it's also interesting to juxtapose that on the other movements that are occurring. And you mentioned Me Too as being one, and what is going on in Australia here at the moment with uh, sexual harassment and, uh, you know, respect for women's rights to be able to feel safe. Um, this is another, this is uh, opening up another whole can of worms and, and an important one, critically important one. That's another area we're seeing um, added on to this COVID world. Yeah, it's, and, and, and like I say, that is a big reason that I wrote the book. COVID <laughs> hadn't happened yet. We were a few you know, how, how many months away from it. it wasn't that far before before it but me too was and as you say it's you know we're almost in the second wave of that at the moment aren't we in Australia mm. it's incredible to see very moving very very moving very powerful stuff we're seeing said and shared and in terms of their trauma I mean it's 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 deep and it's and it's and it's real that's mm. what I would say but I would feel more hopeful about it today than I did two months ago oh, because they're speaking. Yes. They're, they're up there. They're sharing, you know, the, 
shame obviously is, is a big part of, of, of sexual assault and mm. any any kind mm. we're and actually a lot of a, a lot of trauma generally especially relational trauma the kind of relation uh, trauma that happens within relationships whether there's sexual assault or not or sexual abuse shame is a big big part of it but it can it can only exist in silence i don't know if you've heard that phrase before but Shame can only exist in silence. And, and I have seen that to be true time and time and time again. And when I first heard that phrase and began to explore it professionally and personally and began to apply it to myself and then the people I worked with, I realized the truth of that. Mm. When, we, when we speak it, it dissipates. It's a very odd thing. But as soon as you say to someone, Do you know, I'm feeling really ashamed about X, Y, Z, whatever it is, whether it's a small thing from your day, something to do with your parenting, something to do with your, whatever it might be, you speak it and it dissolves. It's like this granular thing. It just, okay, not with, maybe not with the big things. Maybe you need to keep speaking about it. Keep, you know, keep voicing it. But the fact that these women are standing up and, 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 and voicing it on a personal level, it makes me, I mean, makes me, I'm just so incredibly proud and emotional, but I, I know that it's, their pathway to healing mm. because they're, they're, they're voicing it. And so their shame will, if they do carry any, mm. not that they all will, but if they do, it will dissipate mm. and quite right. And I guess the same can be true said for what is being emerged as domestic, you know, the consciousness, the conversation about domestic violence and child sexual abuse as well. These are all about that. And, and I was interested because you, your journey from a lobbyist in the music industry um, and and your your association with reprieve, but your own epiphany in your own therapy, the kind of the therapist you were with at the time identified. Hang on, this sounds to me like trauma, and and it is about that for many people about an awakening. How do we start that journey? I think for each of us, it can be quite different. I think if people are listening to this and it's ringing true. You know, if it resonates, because I think I think that's the thing. I think some people hear the messages I'm saying and they just know it's true. They just know for them that there's a truth here, that what they're experiencing today is a reaction to something that happened in the past and they want to explore it. And there are so many ways you can do that. You know, there are so many things you can do at home. Think about what I'm saying in terms of getting things moving. You know, a lot of the a lot of the. Um, the tools that I teach people to use at home, they're very simple. You know, one, notice how you're feeling. So just notice your feelings and allow them, you know, so, so name, what are you, what are you feeling? Don't, don't run off. Don't go and do the dishes. Don't race to pick the kids up. Pause. Notice how you're feeling. Where is it in your body? So in body, that's a big thing with trauma. We come back into our body because often the whole reaction is almost about leaving. It's about avoiding the feelings. So come back into your body. Notice where it is. If you're feeling afraid, where do you feel it? Is it, is it up in your shoulders or where's the tension? So notice the feeling. Notice the tension in your body. Be with it and allow it. And what's fascinating is the more you work with that, the more you realize that this simple concept of noticing and allowing allows your body to kind of move through the feeling. So instead of getting stuck in it, you know, imagine what would have happened. So we have the opportunity to either notice, allow it, have a cry if we need to, make a call to a friend if we need to. Okay, so that shifts it, it releases the feeling, it gets things moving. And then whew, take a breath, we go on with our day, right? If we don't do that, imagine the scenario, we've tamped it down. So we've pushed all that fear down or all the shame down. We, how do we feel? We probably feel anxious and nervous. We're going to spend the day running around. We'll find things to clean. We'll find things to do. We don't feel settled. We we can't be still. But can you relate to that feeling? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, this is a, actually in my, uh, in I believe we should be listening to our body um, yeah. and we get report cards each and every day, you know, even the, even the way we go, you know, what happens on the toilet is an important report card, which we've done a program on about what does your poo say about you. You look at skin as a reflection of nutrition and, and that, 
But here we're talking about let's look a little bit deeper here about let's listen to your body and your feelings. Let's listen to your feelings, not just the physical body, but your feelings. I, I love it. It's music Ab- to my ears, absolutely. Sarah. Music absolutely. Music to my ears. And it's so it's so easy and it's so difficult. Because yes. you say it to people and you're like, all you need to do, you just feel a feeling. You feel like, hang on, something's yes. going on here. You just need to pause, notice the feeling, take a minute. Where it sounds easy, right? Mm. It's not. It's hard because we're used to and we're taught to. Society teaches us to get on with the day. Pull your socks up and get on with the day. Get to school, get to work, be busy, keep moving. So we, we've been programmed to pull away from, from, from the pause. We've been programmed to just keep moving. Doesn't matter. It'll, it'll go. It's not important. And, and when we're thinking about trauma, it, 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 that reaction to, to keep moving and avoid is the problem. And it will keep you stuck. So if you're worried, that simple tool will start things moving. And who knows where you'll go from there. There are other tools we can use at home. And actually, there are seven in the book. Um, Could you share a couple of those with us? Yes. Well, that one, Feel Your Feelings, is in there, actually. Yeah, Feel Your Feelings. And I I was going to ask you, uh, you know, again, as you said, it's easier said than done. It's like saying to somebody, well, you can't change things really, but you can change the way you think about it. Um, well, that's true, and it's probably the biggest tool we have, but how do you do that? Yeah. How do you feel a feeling? How do you feel a feeling? What a great question. Honestly, it's hilarious. If, you'd, if we'd have had this conversation 15 years ago, I'd be going, I don't know. What a feeling. <laughs> well, you've done a PhD, a Sarah. You haven't. You've written a book and done a PhD. I mean, no, but I, mean, I mean on a personal level. Yes, yes. No, I, I know that. I, that's I, why I'm could, asking I, you. I could not feel my feelings. You know, this was yep. my nemesis. Then okay. I write about this in the book. I, yep. I remember, I mean, I worked with a therapist for five years. Five years, not weekly sessions, but hmm. over five years we did – gentle somatic work and I did my trauma work it was an important very important time for me but I remember sessions with her when she would say how are you feeling and I I I just I don't I don't know I don't know how do you wear what do you mean how am I feeling do you mean I don't get it and I just honestly I couldn't do it Uh, for me it was because I was she would ask and I would almost dissociate it was too much for me it was like you know where are my feelings I'm not sure I was overwhelmed even by the question so so no, for, and and maybe some people who are listening will be able to relate to that. I think that's absolutely what you know, a lot of people will be able to it, relate to. It is confusing, and it like everything, you know. Now we're in the realm of neuroplasticity habits. We get this stuff now, don't we? It's all about repetition and practice. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> the more you practice this, the better you'll get at it. But take your time if you can be with your feelings and I remember my therapist saying this to me if you can be with that feeling so say you notice you think oh I think I'm feeling afraid if you can be with that feeling for even one second longer today than you were yesterday that's a win Mm -hmm. and when it it's interesting when you talk about feeling Sarah because um it occurs to me that I wondered whether there was a significant difference between men and women in how they process trauma and and when you mentioned feelings I, I I thought about myself because often if my wife asks me what's wrong you know how are you feeling and I actually need to I, sometimes it takes me a day or two to be able to articulate and she says I've crawled into my cave um and and uh, you know so I wonder uh, whether um you know have you is there a difference between the way men and women experience trauma and they, and they, and are able to express their feelings. That's very interesting. That there, there there isn't a huge amount on that, to be honest. Hmm. I mean, women are more likely to experience it. So so it's hmm. that they're, they're t- you tend to see see that pop up in the research. But in terms of the actual, I'm thinking about the sort of perseverance of trauma symptoms and what we see. This that they're fairly similar. I believe men are more prone to avoidant coping, to avoidance yes. generally. Yes. Not avoiding That's coping, true. I shouldn't have said that, but avoiding their feelings. Yes. Yeah. You see that a lot and, and you do yeah. see that gender difference pop up, which is exactly what you've just said. Yeah. You know, there is a tendency to push away. Mm. Um, so that's the main thing. So then when we pop back into the trauma space, if we take that fact and then come back into the trauma space, you would say, well, 
you know, it puts them at a higher risk to 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 end up being stuck in the symptoms mm. if they're more prone to avoidant yeah. to avoiding their feelings. Yeah. But it's not across the board. No. You see, many many women do it as well. But you mentioned you mentioned you had seven things, and I and I know triggers is one of them. I wonder if we could just talk about triggers. Yes, absolutely. So. Triggers, I'm sure many people listening will be really familiar with that term. We, it's used quite wide, widely nowadays, isn't it? But it, but it does come from trauma. It's, it's, a, it's inherently linked to the traumatic reaction and the traumatic process because we're, we're triggered. So when, when we're reminded of a past overwhelming, threatening event today, when, when we're reminded of it in any way, so say someone uses a similar tone of voice, and I don't mean I should. So I'm going to pause there and say I don't mean consciously reminded. So I don't mean you're suddenly going to think, oh, I am being reminded of that event when I was four years old. It's not like that at all. It's very physical, a very subconscious, hmm. emotional and physical reminder. So we're reminded of we hear someone speak in a similar tone of voice as our, as our father did, perhaps. Or we're in a certain situation that reminds us of a a traumatic time at school, whatever it might be, any kind of reminder, a smell, an image, a situation, a person, really, it's extremely varied. So we're reminded of the past trauma and that triggers our old reaction. And it's not exactly the same. So the triggered reaction isn't exactly the same as the reaction that we would have had when we were younger, but you're in the same ballpark. Very, very similar. Um, And that obviously just pulls us back into that loop of reactions, which is extremely difficult because, and I do say this in the book, triggers are only a problem if you don't realise you're triggered. If you know you're being triggered, so say you're having an argument with with your partner, for example, and you you find yourself really overreacting. But there's there's a phrase in the book that's, if it's hysterical, it's historical. Okay, so if you experience a big reaction to something, it's highly likely you've been triggered. I really mean that. It works across the board. Okay, so what we're looking for are big overreactions. So my reaction doesn't seem to fit the situation that I'm in. I seem to be feeling overwhelmingly frightened, and all I'm doing is dropping my kid off at school. It's it's that kind of thing where the, where the reaction isn't really fitting the situation does that make sense oh yeah it causes such a problem for people mm. primarily because people don't realize they're triggered so so we wind up feeling really confused well, why am i feeling so afraid every time i have to go into a board meeting or well, why am i feeling so angry every time i'm around my friend meg you know it's so confusing there are these parts of life that we just don't really get because the reaction isn't isn't really fitting with the situation well, I would say to anyone listening, if you're experiencing that kind of thing, strong reactions in a similar type of situation, you're being triggered. Okay, so you're, you're, you're being reminded of a past overwhelming event, overwhelming and threatening event. And in the book, to kind of get to grips with this, because it can feel, it can feel overwhelming. Well, well, when am I triggered and how am I triggered and what's the reaction and what's the trigger? So what I encourage people to do is, is just get a simple journal, a simple diary or a note- notebook put the date, today's date at the top. Uh, So what you're going to be writing down is the trigger, the reaction, and then under that, the part, whether it links to the past event. So trigger, reaction, past, question mark. So you'll write down the trigger because you'll have noticed that you are reacting and you won't need to, you don't need to do this perfectly, but you'll write down the trigger. So I was triggered um, in a conversation with my mum. All you need to write, something like that. Or I was triggered when one of the children threw a threw, threw a cup or, or something like that just, just and you're not going to be sure you're not going to be writing it down i'm absolutely certain that was the trigger but you're going to be writing down your best guess at what led to your overreaction and you're going to write down what that overreaction felt like what did you do did you feel afraid overwhelmed did you feel ashamed did you what what was going on what was going on with your feelings what was going on in your mind so what were you thinking so I suddenly was my, my thinking I became really negative or it was spiraling or I began worrying or I began obsessively thinking about, you know, whatever it was, whatever was going in there, note it down. And also behaviorally, what did you do? Did you walk off? Did you overeat? Did you call someone? What was the behavioral reaction? OK, so those three things. So we're going to we're going to really try and pick apart that reaction. And then if people want to, they're going to have a think about whether. 
it relates to a past event. So did anything come to mind? And we're not going to push. We're not going to really dig around for information. But as people start working like this, they they realize that actually as they have the reaction, do you know, as I was having that reaction, my mum kept popping into my mind. It's very curious. As you, as you begin doing the work, you realize actually as you start, instead of censoring the information that your body and your feelings and your mind are giving you, as you go with it and really begin to observe, you realize that there are clues there, that your body is actually trying to show you what, what it links to in the past. Mm. So not, not every time, but sometimes. Mm. Mm. And, and if we repeat that, those three simple things, trigger, reaction, past, question mark, if, if people want to do that last bit, if they feel comfortable doing it. If you can repeat that for a week or two, you will start to see your patterns. And that's what this is all about. Mm. It's about observing the patterns that we're stuck in. And that's the trauma. That's the repetition. Trauma is inherently about repetition. Okay, Mm -hmm. so that's what we're trying to find. We're trying to find where we're stuck, where we're repeating in life, where we're reacting from the past and being pulled away from the strong adult that we are today and being pulled into an old reaction that we want to grow past. We all want to grow out of those things, don't we? Mm -hmm. Wow. So, okay, practicing our feelings, exercising Mm. that uh, uh, becoming aware of triggers. Give us, give us. Oh, we're not going to go through all seven because people have to read this book. But give us another <laughs> one. This is just, this is beautiful. I'm loving this. Keep going. Um, let me think. What would be? I'm trying to think of the ones that would be the most applicable to the most people. Um, I would say the. I would say reigning in your thinking is probably okay. Very. Um, applicable across the board, isn't it? <clears throat> what do you mean by that? So trauma, traumatic reactions, when we're triggered, they happen in a kind of a cycle or a loop. So initially we, so we're reminded of the old experience and then initially we'll experience it in a very physical and emotional way. We'll feel suddenly frightened or suddenly ashamed or suddenly angry, you know, whatever it might be. And all of the physical things that go along with that. And and that then affects our thinking. So so what's going on when that happens is that our nervous system is suddenly flooded with all the stress hormones, adrenaline and and all noradrenaline and everything else. And of course, they affect our mind too. So our body is flooded and our mind is flooded with these hormones. And that seems to be the piece of it that a lot of people miss. It's not just the physical thing. It's, It's your mind is flooded with hormones you cannot think straight okay that's the truth so when we're triggered our thinking spirals our self our old beliefs are triggered so our our self-limiting traumatic beliefs are triggered i'm a failure i'm a bad i'm bad no one loves me the world's unsafe people can't be trusted all these old beliefs are triggered Okay, so we've got all of those going on and our and our thinking is spiraling. And by that, I mean, the adrenaline is just creating, you know, those racy thoughts, thoughts are racing and feel very fear based often. There's just a just a general feeling of threat through, you know, through our body and in our mind. So it's it's a it's a central part of the traumatic reaction. And I think it's one we don't talk about often enough. And anyone that's been triggered, I'm sure, can relate to that feeling. It's it's it affects your body, it affects your emotions, but it also really affects your thinking, doesn't it? And I think for all of us, we need to be aware that that's going on, because even if in that moment we can just pause and think I've been triggered. okay, I mustn't trust trust my thinking. Essentially, it's that simple. So when I say rain in your thinking, it's in the moment. Okay, so, so the simplest way to explain it is. What, when we're triggered, we, we feel unsafe, right? That's what's happened. So we've been reminded of an experience that made us feel really unsafe, really threatened, yeah? And we've been reminded of that today. So what do we need? What do, what do we really need? We need to feel safe, okay? So the way we reign in our thinking isn't to have a go at ourselves. It's not to be very strict. It's not even to fixate on control. Help yourself feel safe. Reassure yourself. So when we're in this zone of kind of overwhelming, spiraling thinking because we've been triggered, which I would argue 
really i i would say is 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 the cause i can't prove this is not based on my research at all but i believe from from speaking to people very often it comes back to being triggered very often when we experience these moments where our thoughts are racing and we're ruminating we've been triggered we've been reminded of something from a past event first of all don't take your thinking seriously this is not the time to be believing you know it's stories it's what story are you telling yourself but second you you must reassure yourself you notice the thinking okay my spy, my my thinking spiraling I, i'm i my my old beliefs have been triggered however it might be that you would notice it and reassure yourself okay i i hear you you you're frightened i get it it's okay something has frightened you you've been triggered i'm going to look after you you just reassure it's just that gentle reassurance so leaning in, in on that voice instead of the inner critic which mm. which often we do our thinking spirals and and then the inner critic pops up you're a fool why is your why are you worrying about this you shouldn't be so we dive into self-criticism when actually really actually I, I really hope people can hear me when I say this it is the worst thing you can do because you are keeping the flight fight freeze response going when you speak to yourself like that so mm. the only the only way through trauma is through gentleness So when you see yourself reacting, if you can remember having overheard this conversation, you know, hearing this conversation that we're having now, realizing, okay, I think that might mean I've been triggered. I think that means I'm, even though I don't really know why, I think it might mean that I've I've, I've been, I'm afraid of something or something's making, making me feel afraid or threatened or out of control. I'm going to, I'm going to try this reassurance thing, Mm -hmm. you know, just give it a try, play around with it. And I promise you that if you can speak to yourself in that way, if you can reassure the part of you that's been triggered, you will be back on track. You will be reconnected to your adult self much, much, much quicker than if you walk down the critical road. So it's all about gentleness. Yeah, love it. This is this is terrific, and I can't wait to read about the other, you know, the, all seven of these. Let's come back just a little bit here, um, and and I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on um, the new therapy around PTSD and chronic depression, which is often related to probably traumas? I mean, more than likely. You know, this, this uh, we just heard in Australia, the federal government is allocating $15 million for research in psychedelics. And we did actually a podcast interview a few months ago with Mind Medicine Australia, Tanya Dijong, talking about psychedelics and MDMA. Have you had any, have you, must, have you looked into this at all? What are your thoughts on it? I haven't. I've got to be honest. I think it's very important when you sit yeah. in a seat, as I do, to, to explain what your specialities are and what they're not. I am fascinated mm. in the work that they do. And I've spoken to many people who have who are very passionate about it as a form mm. of treatment, <clears throat> especially in the States and Canada, yeah. which which it's been explored a great deal up in Canada, especially. Um, but I don't know a huge amount about it. But I would say that I've met many people who swear by it. Mm. You are very I, excited. As I listen to you and talk about, um, you know, how we can swirl around in our own head in a negative spiral, um, you know, the breakthrough moments that were described to me through this psychedelic MDMA treatment is about the effect it has on the default mode network within our brain, which helps us make connections with memories and with all of our sensory input. So I think it's an area that will be a very interesting one. That's exactly right. And I, and I would interject and say, although it's not my speciality, everything I have read about it leads me to believe that it, it makes so much sense. Hmm. You know, it really does because where I come from. So my research, it's all looking into kind of trauma exists as an unprocessed memory. So it's kind of this scattered memory. So because we were so overwhelmed and because we had all of that big, big fight flight response, all that adrenaline coursing around us, it deeply affected our memory. Our, our, Our brain couldn't function. So, so at the core of the reaction is it's, it's a memory I don't even know. It's it's a, it's a, it's a memory issue really. Mm. So the memory hasn't been filtered down into our long-term memory. So it kind of exists in this splintered way that's sort of part sensory, part feeling. That's why it's so easily triggered because it's not where it should be, right? Mm. It should just be sitting neatly in our long-term memory, but it's not there. 
which is why it's so easily accessed on a day-to-day basis. Mm. So that's where I come from. That's my my research has uh, over the years has had a lot to do with sort of looking at memory and so the the psychedelic stuff and 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 what they're suggesting and exactly as you say how it can unlock and access and 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 help us reform those memories it makes a huge amount of sense to me mm. in terms of where i come from for sure yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, this is just fabulous. I've so enjoyed it. I feel like I've been to the therapist already. Oh, there's so many, <laughs> so many issues that I'm, I'm going to go. I've made notes here because I'm going to deal with these things that you've mentioned. But listen, as we finish up, and obviously we're going to have links to your book, and uh, which is coming out, which has come out by the time this, on the 30th of March, 2021. Yeah. Um, and uh, I wanted us to just take a finally just to take a step back from your role as a as a researcher, as a clinical psychologist, as an author, because we are all on this health journey together through life in our modern world. And what do you think the biggest challenge is for us as individuals on that journey? Well, so not trauma related. I'm not no, allowed not to say trauma, trauma related. Right? Just on our health journey. Well, maybe that is the biggest challenge. I, I think you may have identified it, but uh, you know, putting aside that, in terms of how how we negotiate the world, how we negotiate the world, um, and in our health, you know, looking for better health. So f- physical health. Yeah, physical, mental, emotional, just our journey. Um, I mean, the thing that pops to mind, and I've I've already covered it, I suppose, but I think I I think the the big thing for me, so so this is true within my so within my research, I I looked at groups, so the effect that groups have on our sense of identity and our sense of well being and our overall health. Okay, so how the people around us have a big impact negative or positive Mm -hmm. on our physical health and our mental health and in part that's really a lot to do with sort of the subconscious messages we're getting from the people around us if we're surrounded by people who use alcohol as a way to cope it's going to be really hard not to fall back in the same you know fall in line with that likewise if we're surrounded by people who speak openly about their feelings we over time we're going to feel much more comfortable about doing it so they, that that's that's the simple reason really but it also affects our identity our self-esteem our well-being so from my research I've been blown away by really understanding on a very deep level just how important the people we surround ourselves with are and I would say that on a personal level I have learned that at times very painfully you know that's the truth mm. in a very painful way over the years as I've grown And now I really get it. Like I really get that I need to surround myself by people who build me up, who represent the future that I want and who allow me to be me, you know? So that's, that's, I suppose, where I would, how I would answer that question is Uh I would just really urge people to think about who's around them. Mm. you know and and surround themselves as much as possible with people who lift them up because it literally affects your physical health and your mental health it it, it it's extremely simple but powerful wow what a note to finish on and i'm so grateful to have been surrounded by you this morning and and for us to have had this conversation and for you to share this your work and this book which is so important to everyone Thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. That was so terrific. I mean, you know, I've been, I think we're (laughs) encouraging people to listen to their bodies in terms of their physical um, uh, experience and their and their mental one. And we've talked about what does your poo say about you, and that's a reflection. That's that's your body sending you out a laboratory report card every single day, and you should be listening to it because it gives you an indication of how your digestive system works. And if the gut is the second brain, then that will have an impact on your mood as well and your mental and emotional well being. We also talk about um, being and today. Here's Sarah talking about being in touch with your feelings and practicing that. You know, we've had other podcasts where I remember speaking to Lila Mason about it, about fussy foods, and she saying, 
be persistent and be gentle. And don't just do it once or twice with a child to encourage them to eat uh, a fussy eater, to eat, eat all sorts of food. Be persistent and be gentle. And here Sarah Woodhouse is telling us to practice the experience of being in touch with your feelings and being persistent and gentle. I just love this whole story of, of connecting all the dots from all sorts of different connections. And I think I've said many times that the model of stress that I've been working on in my practice for 40 or so years is a great model for asking all the right questions. And, and I think actually this podcast is a great example of that. And, it, and also the podcast is about personal empowerment. So I hope today's episode has um, triggered, there was another word that we got introduced today to, trigger and being in tune with our feelings. So we're going to have links to Sarah's book, which, as I said, has been released in Australia by uh, Penguin Random House um, uh, on the 30th of March. So do get that copy. I'm looking forward to uh, reading it uh, and um, and I hope you, you will explore it because clearly Trauma means so many things to so many people from the extremes of post-traumatic stress disorder to an event which may have occurred in your life as a child or throughout your life, which you may not have fully appreciated as it had a significant impact on your life. Look, um, we'll have links to that, as I said. Now, don't forget to go on to iTunes and leave us a review. We're trying to push the... Uh, this podcast up to a, a place which I believe it, it should be, and and I'd like it to be. I'd like I'd be happy when look we're getting thousands of podcast downloads a, a month, and I'd be happy when we start getting tens, if not hundreds, of thousands of podcast downloads a month. Anyway, I'm going to keep on doing this until we do. Um, also, download the Unstress with Dr. Ron app. You need to put that in, Unstress with Dr. Ron at the App Store um, to download that and stay in touch with all the latest episodes and all the workshops. And we've got plenty of those coming up, some really exciting courses, online programs, um, and so stay in touch with that. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences, and conclusions.